people, yeah, let's, let's just begin. All right, uh, welcome to the last session of, uh, of EFRA. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Shide of uh, Edinburgh University, who will be talking to us about functional sparse tensor compilation. I'm going to talk about functional sparse tensor compilation. And tensor are important in general. We have seen them in lots of applications such as neural networks, signal processing, and social network analysis. And let's see what the tensor computation by itself looks like. Like this is an example of the code that computes the sparse computes the dense matrix matrix multiplication, which looks really simple. And it's open to lots of optimizations, such as flatten array use uh, Flatten array as a data structure optimization for sparse for dense data, and also loop tiling and parallelization. But what about sparse data? For example, this is a document document representation used in natural language processing applications that uh, has lots of zeros in as values in the matrix, which makes it sparse. And this is an Amazon product we use, which also is really sparse tensors. Wouldn't it be efficient that we use dense tensor algebra, the dense tensor computations, because they're really optimized for tensor computations. But the problem would be that in this way we will, we will allocate all zero elements inside that tensors. And also, we perform the computations on all those zeros elements. So we need for sparse specific data formats and algorithms. What would sparse specific data format would look like? This is a sparse tensor represented in dense representation. And this is a COO representation for sparse data, which is the basic representation is used for sparse representation, which, uh, which have three, uh, three arrays, one allocated, one associated with rows, the other for columns, and the other one for values. And it basically, uh, it basically stores the non-zeros, rows, columns, and values accordingly. But what's the problem with CO representation itself is that we allocate multiple rows in the row array, which could be eliminated, but by compressed sparse row representation, which basically compress the row array and use it as a pointer to the associated index and values for that specific value. Like And what about sparse specific algorithms? Let's say we have the same example of matrix matrix multiplication and we have dense B and C. This, is, this would be the same computation that I showed you before. But what happens when, we, when B gets sparse? The code gets more complicated. And what about when C gets sparse? Even more complicated. There are lots of ifs and y loop inside there. So it's not easy to make it optimized. There are some frameworks, some sparse frameworks like SciPy and JAX that basically use the fixed function algorithm, which means that they use the algorithm designed for each computation separately based on the underlying data formats. But the problem is the generality is challenged with using those, uh, the, with using that method because we have lots of tensor expression and lots of storage formats. And it's not possible to write down, algor write down the optimized algorithm for each of them. So there are tensors, uh, tensor, sparse tensor algebra compilers trying to generate the optimized code for kernels without regarding the exact computation and the underlying data formats. This is a row major tree representation first introduced by tacos taco guys to represent sparse data uh, as a tree representation. Having the same example, this would be the sparse, uh, it, this would be the row major tree representation of the same matrix, which basically is 
uh, which basically first points to the rows and then points to the columns and then the associated values for each row and column. And that's the same M2 tree represented in the tree representation. And why we are using that? Because like it's uh, really easy to convert that to representation to the CSR representation, the basic representation used for sparse data. And the benefit of that is by this representation, we could represent every tensors with any order because we just say the tensor is sparse or dense in each dimension. And this is an example of matrix vector multiplication when both B and C are sparse. And uh, B, in this example, B is sorted in row major, meaning that we first store the rows and then columns. And as we see, we first can iterate over the i's and then iterate over j, which is the first and second dimension of P. But what happens is, what happens when B gets, B is stored in column major format. We don't have access to i directly. So we need to introduce a loop reordering as an optimization to just change the order of loops. And this is the example that Taco introduced previously. So we first iterate over j's and then iterate over i, which is dif different from the previous loop order we had. All I talked about was about sparse input and what happens when the output gets sparse. For having this example, which is basically a column summation of a sparse matrix, we basically need to iterate over each rows and add the associated column and the value to a sparse vector representation. But when we are going to the next row, what happens is we need to insert the column zero with its value two, which means we need to insert before the previous inserted values into the array, which is not easy to do. And another thing is when we are Inserting, uh, we are, then we are reading row four, we need to insert column two with its value four, which already been there. So we need to keep track of the columns in the output and update them. But how efficiently we can do that? An intermediate workspace was first also introduced by tacos, which means that they, they, the idea is to use an intermediate dense result instead of computing the exact sparse output and then convert it to the sparse output that we wanted to. And this is the general taco architecture that I explained till now. And by scheduling, by pure computer schedule is basically inserting that intermediate workspaces and reordering is the loop reordering. But still taco is very limited compared to, uh, compared to what we want from a sparse tensor compiler to be. When the output is dense, everything is okay for all these kernels that, is, that, are, that have an application. But when the uh, output gets dense, gets sparse, we can see that Taco generates wrong answers. But like, why is that? Having this previous example, this, this is what the sparse output we expected to be generated. But this is what we get from Taco because they cannot insert that intermediate workspaces automatically. The user needs to identify where the workspaces need to be inserted, and they cannot detect where to update. So they basically just insert whatever they see as columns and values. And when the output gets more sparse, they even, the, the code they generate cannot be even compiled. So what's the problem with the art? picture that Taco has is that it's mon it has monolithic design, which means that they do everything in one step of transformation. They do all the recomputation it's needed in scheduling, and they just use the data format at the end. What we want to do is to introduce a compiler that is able to actually compute every, uh, every, of this, every single of these kernels with source output. So this is the architecture of the compiler that we introduced, and I'm going to explain how it works. And the key uh, point of that is separation of concerns, which means that we 
or we tackle each problem at each level of learning instead of having all of them in the same transformation. And this is how powerful it is, is compared to our architecture. And for example, uh, we are going to, I'm, go I'm going to use MTTKRP, which is a well-known kernel in Tensor Algebra Computations, and going to explain how the system, how the compiler works for this example. First, we're gonna see what's the inputs of the compiler. This is the Tensor Algebra expression, and the index order identifies which order we want to iterate over the inputs and computes the output. And data format specifies if the, output, if the data, input and output, are sparse or dense in each dimension. In the tensor lowering, we're going to lower the tensor algebra expression into HCM intermediate representation, which basically identifies what's the loop order and how we can get those indices from the inputs. For example, we can see that I has been appeared as the first index of B. So we translated to for each i in ib, which denotes the index of b. And what happens when we have two, uh, appear two occurrence of same index in two inputs is that we do the intersect of those uh, index spaces. And we do the same, and this is how we compute the output in general. And then we use a SQL as the next intermediate representation, which was firstly, which is a functional programming language to query against uh, dictionaries, semi-ring dictionaries. And these are the key construct of it, which dict k is how we can define how we can access key k of dictionary dict. And the next is how we can construct a dictionary from k, uh, which has key k's to values v. And the sum uh, construct basically folds over key and value pairs in dictionary and compute the uh, f over each values and sum them up. And this is an example of vector Hadamard product using the same, uh, using a SQL representation, <coughs> which we iterate over V1 and then construct the dictionary from I to the value which is V1I and we get the uh, associated value for I in V2. But why we want to use a SQL, a functional language as intermediate representation is, again, getting back to the example we had, the data representation for sparse output, it's really similar to what a dictionary would look like. And this is a dense sparse representation for the outputs to be consistent with the CSR. The first, uh, the first column is a dense array, basically pointing to the dictionary for each, for each row's values. And the reason we want to use dictionaries is they have a one lookup and update which would make it easy when the output is sparse, as we've seen the problem previously. And now I'm going to say how we do the HCM lowering, which is basically going from the HCM language to SQL. The key point is how we translate for each I in IB, when the, and also we construct the dictionary associated with that key whenever we are iterating over that key. Like here, we are iterating, we are getting in the, we are getting key i inside b, and the output has key i, so we construct a dictionary from key i to what is computed in the future. And whenever we have two, we have an intersect of two index spaces, we choose the one who, which is sparse. For this example, both V and C are sparse. So we each, there's no difference between iterating over each of them. So we iterate over B and do the code motion for C, K. So in the future, we wouldn't look up for the same value multiple times. And now I'm going to say what LLQL as an intermediate representation is. LLQL is basically closer to low level language. It's similar to SQL, but it's 
extended the, its type system. SQL only had one dictionary type, which was unsorted dictionaries, but LLQL can, be exp can express sorted dictionaries, unsorted dictionaries, which was the hash, and list map for intermediate workspaces. And it also has, uh, it also has another, it also has constructs for optimization. Uh, the reason we wanted to extend that the type system of SDQL was that the sparse sensor data are stored, uh, are sorted. So we iterate over them in order, which wasn't, the case, which wasn't as fast in unsorted maps because we, it wasn't uh, cache, it wasn't used cache locality, which sorted map has. And also, we extended the construct to express data-specific optimization for sorted dictionaries. And the key note to just mention from when we're going from L SDQL to LLQL is that we, uh, we identify what's the type of the output. And this notation means that the output is sorted dictionaries of sorted dictionaries, basically nested sorted dictionaries. And we also apply code motion for the output because we define the variable for that, so we don't access the same variable multiple times. The problem now is that when we changed, we converted from unordered map to ordered map, Iterating over them became faster, but lookup complexity time is O of log N, which was O1 previously. To solving that problem, we use hinted dictionaries, which is a functional, uh, functional order construct for, uh, con to optimize the operations over sorted dictionaries. And what they do is basically having a hint which points to the beginning or like anywhere in the list and hints the lookup or updates to start from that point. And if they weren't there, it starts to look up O log N. And this is how we uh, uh, look for the place and inject the hint uh, variable, which needed to be exactly before the loop we starting to update that variable. So it would consist with the order that we are iterating over that. And this is how the uh, lookup became hinted by passing the hint object to the lookup function. And this is how hinted update works. We are passing also hints for updates to see, to start from the, uh, from the place that we know the update would be happens in. The other optimization is workspace reasoning. As I mentioned before, like the workspace that Taco used. Uh, here we are updating AI with key J multiple times with the same key because we are updating it inside two other loop. So same key J may occurs multiple times. So we define a listed list map variable to compute the AI uh, uh, and then convert it to the representation we had, which was sorted map, and then clear the intermediate workspace. And the code generation is basically simple as translating everything we had in LLQL to the C++ code that computes the same thing. For evaluation, we have uh, we, we are going to see the evaluation result for sparse general matrix matrix multiplication and tensor times matrix. Um, this is how unsorted dictionaries compared to Taco performed, which is way slower because of that uh, because iterate because of iterating over an unsorted map, which was really slow. And then we convert it to sorted dictionaries, which is even slower than unsorted dictionaries because of the lookup and updates time. So after we applied hinted dictionaries, this is how faster we can get, which is, as, which is kind of as fast as Taco. 
but when we are applying hinted dictionaries and workspaces, it gets faster than Tarkos, one plus five. Which really depends on the, on the like, amount of update with the same keys. It could be cases where in inserting workspaces would uh, increase the time because there is not that much updates with the same key for each web. And for TTM kernel, we evaluate over real world data sets, which, MIPS, which are MIPS2 and NIL2. And uh, these are the results compared to TACO, which we are faster. And the star is the one that, uh, and there is no need to use intermediate workspaces here. There is only updates for, there is only optimization for hinted dictionaries because TACO, as, you, as I mentioned before, wasn't able to compute other kernels automatically. And to conclude what I've said, STAR is a robust modular compiler for sparse tensor algebra, which use, function, which use multiple functional intermediate languages to go from the tensor algebra expression uh, to the C++ code that computes that expression. STQL was previously also used for forward mode automatic differentiation uh, to differentiate, to com automatically compute differentiation for sparse tensor algebra expressions, but it was limited to forward mode. So the next, the future work could be <coughs> uh, implementing backward automatic differentiation on top of the star that I just introduced. Thanks. Yeah, I will actually use the, uh, my prerogative as chair to ask the first question. Um, so what about parallelization? This was sequential code, right? And mm -hmm. these hints seem like stateful objects. Have you put any thought into how that, uh, what you might do in a parallel setting? Parallelization for the, like the yeah, whole for, computation. Yes. Yeah. For the compilation or for the computation? For the computation. For the computation. For the computation, one parallelization would be with, uh, we know, like, like using, in, uh, using uh, dictionaries. Each key is that we are so each key is that stored in dictionaries is basically the data that we have. So by passing each of those like indices to one thread, we could parallelize the computation. But I haven't done any job on that. That's just the thought I have. All right. Does it? Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, it seems that a lot of the performance gains here come from using the hinted dictionary. Right? Mm -hmm. What is the like the complexity compared to a regular dictionary? Is the amortized complexity uh, smaller, or is it just uh, just like a constant gain from using the hints? Uh, it's constant gain because like the the only difference between hinted dictionaries and the normal dictionaries, you mean hash maps, right? Yeah, those or ones. the sort okay. of maps. Uh, oh, okay, the one that we started with. Yeah. Iterating over those is really. Uh, time consuming compared yeah. to the sorted one. So like that's <laughs> the only difference okay. there is. So, yep. Thanks very much. Um, when you showed us the taco times, I, mm -hmm. I was not quite sure what kind of array re representation were you dealing with there? Is that a dense format or? The same representation, the CSR representation for matrices. And for the other one, every, it was sparse in every dimension. So let me, uh, So the memory consumption of, of these algorithms, at, at least in the long scale, is this roughly the same? Yes, because we are, uh, okay, to just, mm, to change, just in, Like what Taco is just basically this one, which has one array for positions of each indices, and one for the columns and one for the values. And the one that we used is um, I guess the question that, that yeah, I'm really is this itching one. to ask okay. is is the uh, the space complexity of both algorithms roughly the same one. Yes, yes, exactly, it is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have another question then. Um, so it's pretty clear to me that forward mode would just sort of work out here. But reverse mode, that, that, rever that reverses the dependencies, so things that become, that were reads become writes and so on. 
Uh, and how does that fit with these uh, hinted uh, dictionaries? Mm -hmm. Because Jasmine stayed there. Uh, have you have you looked at what that might entail? I know you haven't done it yet, but uh, mm -hmm. but how might that work out? Uh, by like reversing reverse reverse mode AD, we are yes, computing yes. from uh, we we define the hint in in the computation pipeline. Mm -hmm. So whenever we are computing the reverse mode AD, we are basically computing some tensor algebra expression if you put it that way. So you basically, for that tensor algebra expression, you define the hint where, where it's needed. All right, so, you, so we, you actually differentiate at a very high level. Of yes, exactly, be yeah, before yeah. coming to yes, the down level right. computation. Um, so one thing this allows you to do also is experiment with when things are sparse and dense, because it is actually a bit unclear when it's worth, how much it should, how sparse it should be before it's worth using a sparse representation. And right now, I think that's usually done manually. You just try out things and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, have you given any thought into automating uh, the exploration of this space about which vectors should be sparse, which matrices should be sparse, which should That's be... That's also another thing that could be done on top of that, basically learning how we should uh, see each computation. Let's say we have a... Like, that's where I started from, to yeah. this project. Because we, I had, a, like, a lot of... Compu like, a com tensor algebra computation, which had lots of intermediate, like, tensors. And it's really important how you order them and how you see each of them. So it, it can be learned on top of that, I guess. Yeah, kind of following his question, I was wondering like how uh, does it compare to tackle, uh, you know, depending on the, de on the density of your input matrix, does it like scale the same way? If we use the dense? No. If, depending on the sparsity of your matrix, right? Because uh, obviously here you're using, you know, a dictionary which is, you know, a bit slower. So I imagine that for denser matrix, uh, it would get slower than Taco. Like it would start to grow a bit more. Yep, it start to grow to, it, it start to grow more if you use like the basic hash dictionaries, but still sorted dictionaries are faster. Um, I didn't mention that in here because it was a part of a journal paper that also su was submitted to somewhere, so that's the reason I didn't mention that too. Any more questions? Otherwise, let's move on to the, well, that's my question for the speaker. I thank the speaker again and then move on to the next question. <laughs>